Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of 2019's Dark Phoenix. This is the 12th installment of our X-Men Snick Snicked Rewatch, as we go back through all 13 of the Fox, X-Men, and Deadpool films ahead of Wolverine's Mutant Homecoming and Deadpool and Wolverine in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But Dark Phoenix has no Wolverine in it, you may say. That is true, but it does have X-Men in it, and there may be things that come back in Deadpool and Wolverine. Dark Phoenix kind of became a victim of the inconvenience and lack of marketing. Right after Disney acquired Fox, they'd begun internally discussing ways to reboot the X-Men franchise, but this film had already been shot and contractually they had to release it. But that lack of studio enthusiasm and trust in the film is evident from the get-go. It's also a film with a complicated legacy because Brian Singer served as a producer during development and pre-production but opted not to return as director and then sexual assault allegations came out about him and his name was removed from the credits. It may actually just be that all X-Men titles are just kind of cursed when it comes to their directors. Yet, a rewatch series is a rewatch series and we must break down Dark Beast Phoenix scene by scene for all the Easter eggs, details you never spotted, and stuff that could maybe come back in Deadpool and Wolverine. And to celebrate this X-Men rewatch, we have these special Xavier Institute shirts, and the best way to support new rock stars is to grab one of these designs by clicking on the link in the description. Okay, like in the previous films of the franchise, the X in the Fox logo lingers after the other parts disappear, but this time it also glows with fiery red and gold Phoenix flames. We open on Jean Grey's narration instead of Charles Xavier since this film is all about her. Are we destined to a fate beyond our control? Or can we evolve, become something more? In 1975, young Jean Grey rides in the car with her parents on the radio. Glenn Campbell sings Jimmy Webb's By the Time I Get to Phoenix, which is, you know, a kind of on the nose choice. But Jean wants her mom to change the station, showing her resistance to becoming the Phoenix. And Jean telepathically changes the radio channel to Werewolves of London, a song that was inspired by the 1935 film Werewolf of London about another person who couldn't control a change into a horrible, murderous beast. But Jean is not able to control her powers yet, and she causes the car to crash, killing her mother. Jean instinctively protects herself with a telepathic shield, confusing the doctors who claim she should have more injuries after an accident like that. In the hospital bed, her hair is spread out behind her. Just like in the comics, when she rises up as a phoenix, Charles greets her, telling her that both her parents are dead, which we find out later is a lie. Her father is still very much alive. Jean goes to live at the school where Charles earns her trust by telling her she's not broken. But then he sort of, you know, takes advantage of that trust by locking away the memories of her mother's death and her father's rejection of her. Now, in the comics and in the X-Men animated series continuity, Jean doesn't lose her mom. She watches her childhood friend Annie Richardson get hit by a car and experiences Annie's pain the moment of her death, and that is what triggers Jean's powers. And yes, this is all an alteration from the moment Charles and Eric recruit young Jean Grey as depicted in the prologue of 2006's X-Men The Last Stand, but by setting this movie's prologue in 1975, it would be two years after Wolverine and Mystique and everyone else changed the course of history as depicted in the events of X-Men Days of Future Past, and one of those butterfly effects was this this new origin story for a young Jean Grey. Now, in the opening titles, Dark Phoenix is a metallic color, but the O turns fiery red with embers rising off of it and into the air. Director Simon Kinberg, making his directorial debut here, opted to drop the X-Men from the title after the success of Logan. He considered this an end to a chapter the way Logan was and wanted to make it clear that Jean was the focus. Though, internationally, the title was still X-Men Dark Phoenix. And I may be wrong about this, but I have always theorized that it may be a legal contractual issue that Brian Singer as a legacy producer may get a cut of any movie that is released domestically with X-Men in the title. Though I kind of like Kinberg's explanation here. So at this point in the X-Men films, the timeline and the storylines had, yeah, gotten pretty muddled. The Phoenix Force first showed up in X2 when Jean saved the others from the flood at Alkali Lake. Then the Dark Phoenix storyline was sort of adapted for X-Men The Last Stand, but the events of Days of Future Past seemingly rewrote a lot of this, since when Wolverine's consciousness returned to the present, Jean was still alive and she seemed fine. In X-Men Apocalypse, Charles encourages Jean to let her powers free, and as she defeated Apocalypse, the Phoenix Force spread out behind her. Kinberg admitted that he ignored that little plot point in Apocalypse because he wanted the Phoenix Force to be otherworldly as opposed to something inherent within Jean, which I will say was an admirable choice, because as we talked about with our X-Men The Last Stand breakdown, back in the mid-aughts, it was kind of like a popular in vogue thing to say that one's superpowers comes from like a mental condition inside one's psychosis. But what is truly the case with the Phoenix Force in the comics is that it is 
is supposed to be a cosmic entity from outer space. And that's what he tries to do in this movie. Not necessarily more successfully though. In Chris Claremont's Dark Phoenix storyline, the Phoenix encountered Jean when she was little and laid dormant until it refound her later in life while they were on a mission in space. And that's kind of what we see in this movie. Kinberg actually originally wanted this to be two separate films with the first intended to make audiences fall in love with Jean and the second intending to break their hearts. But Fox feeling burned from Apocalypse's poor box office performance and reviews mandated that this just be one film. We jump ahead to the present day, which here is 1992, which is the same year that X-Men the Animated Series debuted. And back when this movie came out, if you had to ask me which franchise, either the live action one or the 92 animated series, would we see on Disney Plus in the year 2024, I would not have said the animated series, but here we are, and we're better off for it, I think. But here in 1992, the space shuttle Endeavor has some major problems soon after takeoff, and the president uses an X phone to contact Charles. In this new timeline, mutants really do have more power and influence in society than we previously seen. But Charles knows how precarious their position still is. In an extended scene at NASA, two of the men monitoring the shuttle shrug off what they think is just something on the lens for realizing it's more serious than that. To deal with the crisis, Charles sends his current X-Men team, which is Hank McCoy, Beast, Nicholas Holt, Raven, Slash Mystique, Jennifer Lawrence, Peter Maximoff, Quicksilver, Evan Peters, who doesn't get enough to do in this movie, Scott Summers, Slash Cyclops, Ty Sheridan, Jean Grey, Sophie Turner, Kurt Wagner, Nightcrawler, Cody Smith McPhee, and Aurora Monroe, Storm, Alexandra Ship. Unfortunately, some of the best characters are relegated to the sidelines in this film, and at least one of the actors wasn't happy about it. Alexandra Ship was very vocal about Storm not having much to do in this movie, which is also a complaint that Halle Berry had about the character when she played her. And I will say it now, the MCU needs to lead off its X-Men relaunch with Storm. Storm is the coolest character, and we need a proper live action Storm kicking off their new era of X-Men. But you'll notice this team wears new costumes, doing away with the ones that they wore at the very end of X-Men Apocalypse and instead opting for the Frank Quietly designs from the new X-Men by Grant Morrison. Their jet rises up from under the basketball court and just like in the first film, a left behind basketball rolls as the court opens. The X-Men discover that the solar flares shorted out the shuttle's equipment. They save the astronauts before the shuttle can crack apart, but Jean is blasted by the flare and absorbs the Phoenix Force. When she first opens her eyes, their usual blue color is replaced with a gold color. And when they set back down to Earth, they are greeted as heroes by a crowd with supportive signs painted blue faces and even action figures of them, which is quite the change from the usual angry protest signs disparaging mutants. But the action figure is always interesting to me because it kind of feels like Simon Kinberg or someone at Fox wanted to suggest that this year of 1992 would have led to the future 2029 where there were Wolverine action figures in existence. Actually, an extended version of the scene would have shown Quicksilver signing autographs and Gene beginning to hear the thoughts of the large crowd. The group celebrates their victory by going to a mutant bonfire where Gene pounds drinks and Storm is relegated to the role of Ice Maker. Dazzler, played by Halston Sage, provides the entertainment. The guy igniting the bonfire is Match, Ben Hamill, played by Lamar Johnson. You may have noticed throughout the series that all the X-Men films would just try to flex their IP strength by adding random mutants to the background. But of all of the movies, these cameos in Dark Phoenix just kind of feel the most obligatory and purposeless. Hank and Raven reminisce about old times. You know, it wasn't so long ago we were throwing parties like this. Now we're the only ones left. Last of the first class. We saw their teen mutant party in first class. They're the only ones left after Darwin was killed by Shaw in that film, and Angel and Banshee were killed as part of Trask's experiments before the events of Days of Future Past, and Havoc died in the mansion explosion in Apocalypse. It's also worth noting that this is one of the only three films in our X-Men rewatch that does not feature Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, the other two being Deadpool and New Mutants. Though his face does show up in Deadpool, he is seen in old Origins footage in the post credit scene of Deadpool 2. The alien race of the Debar arrive on Earth looking for the Phoenix. These guys appeared in the Dark Phoenix comics as a race that got annihilated when Dark Phoenix flew off in space to recharge using a star, destroying the Dabari solar system, leaving only a few survivors. Their story seems to be the same here. In the animated series, the system the Phoenix destroyed is emphasized as being uninhabited since they didn't want millions dying in a kid's cartoon. Jessica Chastain makes her Marvel debut playing two roles, Margaret Smith, the host of this dinner party, and Vuk, the Dabari who shapeshifts into Margaret when she goes to check on her dog. The dog's name is Luna, which could be a reference to Luna Maximoff from the comics, daughter of Quicksilver and Crystal, the first child born of a mutant and an inhuman. Originally, Chastain was going to be playing Lalandra Naramani, Empress of the Shi'ar Empire and love interest to Charles Xavier, the one who, at the end of the X-Men animated series in the 90s, Charles left Earth with to go to the Shi'ar Empire to recover from his coma. But when Simon Kinberg was denied the opportunity to make two separate films, he felt that adapting Lalandra's storyline would be too much time and focus away from Jean. Apparently, 
Apparently, since the name Book is not spoken to Chastain in the film, she didn't really know what her character was called until she watched the movie. In the comics, Book is also known as Starhammer, who used human disguises to sneak around and use his technology to turn Avengers into stone. In addition to removing Lilandra and the Shi'ar from the movie, Kinberg also did away with the plotline featuring the Hellfire Club. He had already gone so far down that road that they'd already had concept sketches done of what all the members would look like, but ultimately, he didn't have time to include them. After the Lilandra storyline was removed, the villains were supposed to have been the Skrulls instead of the Dabari, but that was changed after Marvel Studios announced plans for Captain Marvel that would feature the Skrulls. Although, since the Dabari here are shapeshifters, they basically serve the same purpose and just don't look as good. Not to say the Skrull shapeshifting VFX looks that great either in Captain Marvel or at any point in the MCU, but they just clearly had more budget than what they had here in Dark Phoenix. And I just will remind everyone how great Mystique's shapeshifting looked in that original 2000 X-Men film. I think one of the biggest mistakes in this movie is making your villains shapeshifters and not coming up with like a separately cool way to show that compared to what the studio already created for Mystique. After Charles's speech at the White House, Chris Claremont makes a cameo. He also had cameos in The Last Stand and Days of Future Past. A deleted scene would have shown Charles arriving home early and realizing something is very wrong. Charles, everyone's okay? I can't sense Jean. What's wrong? Where is she? She's upstairs. When Jean talks to Scott in her bedroom, there is a photo on her nightstand that looks a lot like the one from the animated series that Wolverine looks at longingly that inspired all the memes. As Jean's power grows, she telepathically hears her father, who she thought was dead all these years, and she goes to look for him in Red Hook, New York. Now, Simon Kinberg was a co-producer on the FX series Legion, and in the pilot episode of that series, the head of Division 3, the shady government organization that's hunting down mutants, made mention of an incident that happened in Red Hook. That show featured David Holler, who is the son of Charles Xavier, and, like Jean, an Omega level mutant struggling to control his powers. We'd like to thank Clean My Phone for sponsoring this video. Clean My Phone is a brand new AI powered app that can help you clean up your iPhone and iPad from the same people who make Clean My Mac. Clean My Phone is super easy to use and crazy fast. In just a few minutes, Clean My Phone goes through all the photos and videos on your phone and separates out duplicates, screen recording, screenshots, and more so that you can get rid of gigabytes of stuff that you don't need. You can also use Clean My Phone to organize your photos into categories. The AI under the hood can pick out subjects like pets, travel locations, or stretches of time to make your library more manageable and easier to navigate. Clean My Phone can even help diagnose a slow network connection, so you can make sure you're not getting bogged down with needless traffic. It used to be the case that once your iPhone started filling up, you'd have to pony up for an annual iCloud subscription, which could be as much as $36 every year for 200 gigabytes of space. But a one-year subscription to Clean My Phone is only $24.99. Give your iPhone or iPad the glow up it deserves by downloading Clean My Phone from the App Store today and try three days for free. When Jean heard her father, he was saying, table for one, my usual. And this dude is living a sad life, alone in the house where he once lived with his wife and daughter, nothing changed, ordering the same meal at the same restaurant. He's never moved past the trauma of the accident. Jean notices that there are no photos of her on the wall and reads her father's mind to see that it wasn't Charles' decision to take her away and not let her have contact. It was her dad who never wanted to see her again and blamed her for the mom's death. A deleted scene would have shown the other X-Men suiting up to bring Jean home and Raven arguing with Beast about about bringing along a gun to neutralize her. And if you start shooting at her, this whole thing could go sideways. Look, it's Jean. If I can get close to her, talk to her, I can bring her back. Outside Jean's dad's house, parked by some power lines, is a truck with the logo of Bishop Power, which is a nod to Bishop, the mutant who absorbs energy and releases it back out. We saw a version of him in Days of Future Past, and he is also in the first few episodes of X-Men 97. When Mystique dies, she is impaled on three spikes, mirroring her fake death at the end of the first X-Men in 2000, when Wolverine stabbed her with his three adamantium claws. Kinberg admitted that he was heavily influenced by the movie Logan, and this death, by impaling, is reminiscent of Wolverine's death at the end of that film. After Raven's funeral, Charles recalled the events at the beginning of the first class when he met her in his kitchen and he promised her a better life. Hank is pissed at Charles, blaming him for Raven's death. Before she died, Raven told Hank that she loved him, and now this is one of the only times we see the usually logical and kept-together beast unmoored. The Dabari talk to Jean's dad. It's not clear if they kill him or just torture him, but either way, this guy is having a bad day. Considering Book does the whole twisting someone's midsection thing, I think the implication is that she shapeshift into him to gain his memories of Jean before shapeshifting back into Jessica Chastain. In the Secret Evasion series, they establish the whole process of Skrulls stealing memories 
memories as well to help them complete their assimilation of the targets that they shapeshift into. After trying to Lady Macbeth out Raven's bloodstain from her shirt, Jean gets desperate and goes to find Magneto, who now lives on a mutant island colony. It is not spoken in this film, but in the credits, one of the guards is listed as Genosha Sentry. So this is our first live action look at Genosha. Genosha played a huge part in the comics where Magneto established it as an all mutant nation and in the animated series where it was at first the site of a mutant slave camp and then later got taken over by mutant rebels. Magneto repurposed it into his colony and his nation. Magneto we see as fashioned houses and buildings out of metallic scrap like hulls of ships and shipping containers. With these kinds of structures surrounding him, Magneto is ready to turn anything into a weapon and defend its new home if need be. The mutant who asks Jean who she is and what she's doing there is Akiri, played by stuntman Andrew Stellan. He was created for the film and is a composite of a few different characters. He manipulates his hair like a weapon to fight his enemies, which is kind of like the inhuman Medusa, but his braids here are a mix of practical and CGI effects. There's also Celine, played by Coda Everhart. She's a massively powerful mutant from the comics who's believed to be even older than Apocalypse. She's a sometime member of the Hellfire Club and at one point even became the Black Queen. In this film, she just kind of seems like an average mid-powered mutant who gets fairly easily killed. Jean refuses to tell Eric whose blood is on her shirt because she knows he would f her up if he knew it was Raven's. He recounts his history for her, saying that he lost people he loved and lashed out, killing others to try to make the pain go away. This reiteration of all the crap Eric has gone through in his life, losing his parents, then his wife and daughter, sets up why he's so intent on killing Jean later when he finds out what she has done. Raven is yet another in the long line of people he's loved who were killed violently. The military shows up for Jean, who is ready to destroy them all, but Magneto saves them and tells everyone to get the hell off his island. The president is no longer buds with Charles, who was right that it would really only take one bad day to turn people against mutants again and lose them any goodwill that they've earned. Jean goes to a bar where she makes the bartender and patrons see her as an old man. She uses her powers to change the channels on the TV, going from a news story about her to an episode of Picket Fences, which was a 20th century Fox show, then to a couple of other things before turning the TV off completely and demanding another drink from the confused bartender. Vuk, this man who can electrocuted. see through Jean's mental disguise, oh. finds her and explains what's inside her has made her the most powerful creature on the planet. It's the spark that gave gave life to the universe and has the power to create or destroy entire worlds. A frantic Scott tells Charles that Hank is gone. An extended scene would have shown the two searching the lab for Hank and discovering that the jet is missing. Hank finds Eric and tells him that Jean killed Raven. Eric and Raven had a long and complicated history at this point, but he was the one who convinced her not to be ashamed of her true self. And she was the one who convinced him that despite all of his losses, he still had people who loved him. He once again gets his old Magneto helmet, which he keeps in a locker next to a newspaper with the headline, news cameras capture White House. This would be for Magneto and Raven's attack on the White House in Days of Future Past in 1973. The moment Magneto puts on his helmet, the editors cut directly to Charles taking off his Cerebro helmet. And Charles takes Scott, Storm, and Nightcrawler to confront Magneto, Hank, Celine, and Akiri as they try to kill Jean in Vuk's mansion. Charles greets Eric the way the two have many times over the years, but this time, Eric ain't having it. Hello, old friend. Save the old friendship, Charles stay out of my way. The three groups battle it out and pretty much everyone is outmatched by Jean who makes short work of them all. Then she puppets Charles, kind of like how she did to Patrick Stewart's Charles Xavier in The Last Stand before obliterating him. Charles urges Jean to look into his mind to show her her past and how much he cares about her and she remembers herself. Vuk offers to take the power from her and some of the Phoenix Force transfers into her body. This idea of sharing the Phoenix Force among multiple superheroes might have come from the Avengers vs. X-Men comics when Iron Man blasts Phoenix Force with a disruptor and fractures it into five pieces that possess Cyclops, Emma Bross, Colossus, Magic, and Namor, turning them into the Phoenix Five that rules the world for a brief time. And that is what leads to the big battle between Namor and Black Panther in which Wakanda gets flooded, which we see in Black Panther Wakanda forever. But Charles realizes that Book is going to destroy Jean and take over Earth. Jean, let go. Let go, Jean, let go. Which is the same thing that he shouted at her in Apocalypse. Let go, Jean. Jean, let go. <laughs> The mutant containment unit shows up and nabs the X-Men. And yes, that is MCU, in case you didn't realize that Fox had just been bought by Disney and would one day be assimilated into the MCU. They slap them with power dampening collars that we saw in both Deadpool films and the X-Men animated series. I'd like the little detail that they also lock up Nightcrawler's tail, since he obviously could use that as a weapon, a lesson that the alternate timeline would have learned in X2. The whole final sequence of this film was actually reshot extensively. Kinberg originally wanted it to end with a huge space battle, but a combination 
combination of poor test scores from audiences and test screenings, a similarity to the end of Captain Marvel, and not wanting the budget to get any more out of control meant that he had to set it on this train instead. And on that train, Jean lies unconscious and restrained with her arms spread wide, again, just like her Phoenix persona in the comics is often portrayed. Charles lets her loose and she disintegrates into Dabari, just like she disintegrated nearly everyone on Alcatraz Highland in The Last Stand. She carries Book into space, destroying her, and as far as the X-Men know, she also destroys herself in the process. Until the final shot of this film, we think. The school is renamed the Jean Grey School for Gifted Youngsters. This actually happened in the comics, with Wolverine renaming it the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning after he briefly took over it. Jean's closing narration says that she's evolved beyond this world, which yes, Simon Kinberg confirmed means that she is still alive, saying, in a franchise that's obviously about the next step, stage, and evolution, she has taken a huge leap in evolution, beyond the corporeal, beyond human, beyond mutant, into something else. Jean says that this is not the end of her, or the X-Men, but a new beginning, and we see that the school is carrying on, with Storm teaching class, Quicksilver yelling at a kid running through the halls to slow down, which is hilarious for him to say, and Beast in his natural blue form, looking at a framed photo of Raven in her natural blue form. He has finally accepted who he is. A deleted scene would have shown Charles at Raven's graveside, deciding to leave the school and saying goodbye. I'm not as evolved as I thought I was. But in the final scene of this movie, Charles retires to Paris, and Eric finds him and talks him into a game of chess, which the two have played many times throughout the X films. But notice how Charles senses Eric before Eric appears in his periphery. I love that little touch there. And notice what they say to each other. I go easy on you. No, you won't. Which is kind of a callback of sorts to their exchange back in X2. It's been a while since I've played. I'll go easy on you. And this one time, it's Eric's turn to make Charles feel better and remind him of who he is. Long time ago, you saved my life. Then you offered me home. I'd like to do the same for you. Now, the name of the cafe is Cafe Les Vous Copains, which translates to Old Friends Cafe. A reminder that these two men always refer to each other as Old Friend. And the street that it's located on is Rue de la Paix, or Road of Peace. And it's just nice to see these two old friends now finally on a path to peace that they both share. Simon Kinberg said that this scene was supposed to be kind of a nod to the Dark Knight Rises ending, which had a retired Bruce Wayne enjoying his life in a similar outdoor cafe, recognized by his old friend of Alfred Pennyworth. And Hans Zimmer actually did compose the music for this film after swearing off superhero movies after Batman v Superman. So if these swelling bass notes at the end of the movie remind you of the closing montage of the Dark Knight Rises or like Inception, that would be why. And as these bass tones are accompanied by a female vocalist, our final shot shows the Phoenix Firebird blazing across the sky. Now, there is no post credit scene with Simon Kinberg saying that he never considered one because Logan didn't have a post credit scene, and quote, that this movie is a close cousin to Logan in many ways because that was also the final chapter of a sprawling saga. That movie also had rawness and an intimacy and an emotionality that I was trying to capture in this film too. And since he considered Dark Phoenix the conclusion of a 19 year saga, it didn't really require anything at the end of the film. The film, though, is dedicated to the memory of Stan Lee, who passed away in November 2018. And while Dark Phoenix may be few people's favorite X Men movie, the fact that it even exists shows how powerful and popular the X-Men brand was throughout the aughts and the 2010s. And you know what? I think we could see a proper Phoenix Saga storyline in live action at some point in the future of an MCU mutant saga. We saw how awesome it was in episode 3 of X-Men 97, which if you haven't seen, I won't spoil for you here. Go watch it. The character of Jean Grey and Madeline Pryor and Scott Summers and their whole family dynamic is just fascinating and still has so much potential. Next week, I'm going to be breaking down 2020's The New Mutants, which will be the finale of this X-Men rewatch series, but I want to end this video in our danger room for theories and possible spoilers for Deadpool and Wolverine for stuff from this 2019 Dark Phoenix film that could come back. So in Deadpool and Wolverine, if Dark Phoenix comes up at all, I feel like it might just be as a punchline, like how odd it was to try the Dark Phoenix story over again after The Last Stand and to just prolong the Fox X-Men era with a movie that not a ton of people were asking for, or maybe just point out the confusion of characters who were around in the 1960s not really aging over the course of 30 years and suggested to turn into the the aughts era version of these characters. Like you cannot tell me that Nicholas Holt in just a matter of like 10 years is gonna turn into Kelsey Grammer. I mean, McAvoy turning into Patrick Stewart, I kinda could see, but like Fassbender turning into Magneto during that time. Like I understand the events of 1973 diverge these timelines, but not the appearance that these guys were supposed to have to that extent. And I understand the serum that Hank gives himself year after year is supposed to like retain his age, but just like the fact that all the X-Men are ageless and they didn't even try to age them up that much, it's just kind of weird. 
weird. But also we should acknowledge that in Deadpool 2, the lineup of the X-Men that we saw in the back of the mansion were the X-Men from this movie. Notice how Evan Peters was wearing a Nirvana shirt, meaning it would have been from the early 90s. So I just feel like Deadpool's gotta bring it up, you know? But if there are going to be any canonical contributions to the MCU from this movie, at the end of the Marvels, when Monica Rambeau goes into some universe with X-Men in it, the planet Earth that she seems to tumble down toward is covered in a red haze, which makes me wonder if we could be looking at a Phoenix Force that has taken over the planet. Also, this concept of the Phoenix Five that I brought up. I could totally see the Phoenix Force being a force to be reckoned with in Secret Wars. Could we see a true Jean Grey versus Scarlet Witch battle? That'd be one for the ages, especially if Jean Grey could share that wealth with five minions. I'm telling you, there is untapped potential in a live action Jean Grey, and I can't wait to see Marvel Studios do it. Thank you so much to Gina Ippolito for helping me write this breakdown. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.